what you do. Sure, sure. Um, I was just wondering, you know, we started talking about systems and, um, you know, how that kind of points, how that kind of makes the house as a machine more sustainable. Um, but I was wondering, um, you know, by virtue of occupying the house, um, how is it suggesting be more sustainable spatially, materially, etc.? So the, the, the conventional question there is the, well, you, you may be pointing at the LEED certification, things like that. Right. It could be, but uh, we, 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 we're, not, we're not chasing certifications. We're, 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 we're applying our choice of how we want to lead our lives. So one of those choices is to, to reuse materials where we can, and we've done that here. Uh, this is basketball flooring that was uh, salvaged from, from a college and uh, put it for sale at a government auction. And we then bid for that, and we're able to get, in our opinion, high-grade building material at what we felt was a, was a discount. Um, and, and, and the added benefit of not having to put up drywall. So we're not going to have any drywall in the house. That's one of our choices. Um, even though that had, I think, well, anyway. Um, there, is, there is sustainable drywall alternatives out there, but if you don't have to use drywall, why not? Because in this case, it's like furniture. When you, build, when you buy old furniture, you can still strip it and sand it and finish it. But new furniture, you oftentimes can't do that because it was built for appearance as opposed to for performance. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, not all of it. This stuff is, uh, is, you know, it is what it is, one inch maple. <laughs> um, the, we want to live in this house reducing our impact on the environment. We, we, the, our, our journey began with buying land that had been cut over recently. So this, this, you know, someone did whatever. As you probably noticed when you pulled in, that uh, when you turned off of 47, there was a large area of cutover. It's a conventional way of, for people to, to add income by selling the timber off their land. It's not not illegal. Uh, there's, there's, in my opinion, there's lots of things wrong with that because when you look at it from a forestry perspective, it takes over 100 years for that uh, forest layer of generations to reestablish itself. So it's gone now gone and likely they're going to put pine trees on it. So what we've done when we bought the land in the knowledge that it had been cut over and was in the process of coming back was we met with Miller Adams which is the local forester of Charlotte County and spoke to him about what we can do to, to be stewards of the land and, and bring, bring it back as quickly as possible to, to uh, support wildlife and ourselves, our own enjoyment of the, of the land. So you're, you're standing on 50 acres that, that we walked, and uh, he then, after, after probably 10 minutes of disbelief and trying to really understand what I wanted, because most people he then later told me, come to him asking about funds uh, and government sponsorship for putting, in this case, uh, loblolly pine, uh, pines up there, which one you don't have, a, uh, you, know, you don't get the forest again, all you're doing is you're basically, you're not growing corn, you're growing trees on your land, you're gonna cut them off in 20 years again, off you go. So then he understood, and then he had educated me about what's called the crop tree release. And that's where you basically go in and you need in your, in your forest. He taught me how to recognize the preferable trees. And you'll see blue rings on certain trees that are the ones that we pick. And then you just basically go around and with a, with a chainsaw and cut their competitors so that they can grow up. That's where it began before we even had our house this year. So this is how we entered this subject. And at that point, we were camping in a 1960s teardrop camper in the middle of a field. Occasionally, we'd put the camper out in March, and it would be the perfect spot. And then we'd come back, and it would be May, and we'd, we picked, like, the perfect patch of poison ivy to put, <laughs> put the camper. I have to that. That's part of the, the benefit of for us having access to the land and making these choices instead of children uh, grow up with a different understanding. So what is that understanding? For us that understanding is that we simply are more aware of how we use power. So for example, you'll notice the chandeliers on the walls. Um, last night we, we, we turned off the one camping lamp that we had that's battery operated and just operated by a candlelight. It was perfect. So and we'll continue to make those choices as, as the house is built. And then you think about what kind of materials you use, are they biodegradable, and so on. All the right. typical standard stuff that you do today in construction. But what I want to emphasize is that it's much more important for us to think about how you, how, how you live, how you consume, uh, and, and that, 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 
discussion happens outside of Home Depot. Absolutely, and you're inhabiting a house where the systems aren't even finished yet. So right. what better way to understand that then? Well, it's coming for us makes perfect sense because it's sort of progression from, from that room and camper to this, which is pure luxury for us. This is great. Yeah. I mean, the fact that I, I was saying earlier, the, the, in a way, it's Copeland said that we, we do this project pay as you go, and that means that we've had the house uh, in, in more or less this condition, well, minus all the work that we've done on the interior. The envelope has been established for probably a year. So, in that time, we've been in the house, we've, as you can tell, moved in. And we've, we've therefore witnessed how the house performs. And With nothing. I mean, ha we know what the house feels like when it's 10 degrees outside and we still have no systems. Yeah, we, we have, I don't know what the thermometer is, but we have this thermometer that we frequently take pictures of. And, um, and Just so for fun. Because we're so excited that it was X degrees. <laughs> and it was, so, cut a long story short, um, last winter was extremely cold. Uh, we were here during the winter on weekends. We were here in January when it was 11 degrees outside at night, and uh, and inside without uh, augmenting the heat was uh, it, it, it arrived the next morning at 45 degrees. So it sounds horribly cold, but it actually isn't if it's 11 degrees outside, and it just means that the building envelope works in, um, and and it works in the way that it it. It optimizes absorption of heat from the outside, and it minimizes the loss of heat, of heat through the envelope outside. And so you need much less to get to what you consider your, your comfortable 68. Um, you need much less systems. And we've, we had an energy audit performed, so we had it lowered or hooked up into the whole, went through all the tests, and, the, and they confirmed that what we already knew, that the envelope was sufficient. And the result of the energy audit was that they recommended to sort of fall into that scene there and we've begun that process and, and because they were able to, to demonstrate that there was uh, some leakage there and, and things like that. But, uh, so behavior, um, we, the, the, the systems ended up being actually very simple. Uh, I can start with the water collection. We